Uh, thank you very much, uh, Colonel Gill, for that uh, generous introduction. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Arun Kumar, for your kind words of welcome. Uh, let me say that I'm very, very happy this morning to have this opportunity to address officers uh, at the NASIN. And I compliment you on your good work, especially in terms of uh, uh, broadening the discourse in India uh, in the uh, you know, strategic community and uh, to be running, as you are doing, courses uh, with regard to uh, the training of uh, foreign uh, collaborators as well, such as in the Maldives and elsewhere under the ITEC program. Uh, I must uh, tell you that uh, we too, in a way, mirror some of your activities, but uh, in a different context uh, for the IDSA works at the confluence of uh, uh, security issues uh, pertaining to defense, national security, both internal and external, as well as international relations. And we too have uh, global outreach, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know, uh, connections with uh, various institutes uh, and uh, government departments in India. And uh, I'm very glad that we started this uh, relationship with NASIN uh, in uh, the wake of our ongoing, uh, you know, structured courses that we do for the BSF and uh, the ITBP as well. More recently, we have started them for the Indian Ordnance Factory Board as well, uh, the NTRO, uh, and um, from time to time for other forces, including the Army. So this is a welcome development. And uh, since you mentioned uh, uh, that NASIN deals with, uh, you know, customs, indirect taxes, narcotics, your own canvas is very broad, obviously. Uh, and uh, narcotics, uh, uh, just as a takeoff point, is something that uh, is of great interest to India, for uh, India is, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously on the map of uh, transit uh, uh, countries uh, uh, from both flanks, uh, insofar as the, uh, you know, golden, uh, you know, uh, uh, triangle and golden crescent is concerned, India is at those uh, crossroads. It's again at the junction uh, in terms of precursors, in terms of uh, chemicals, in terms of synthetic drugs. Uh, there is a lot that's going on in our region as well. Quite recently, I must tell you, uh, given the kind of importance that we attach uh, to our immediate region in the Indian Ocean, uh, we too at IDSA have uh, been training and giving lectures to the Maldivian uh, you know, defense forces led by General Abdullah Shumal, uh, with whom we have a very good relationship, uh, and that we have been working there in the context of uh, counter-terrorism and more particularly uh, counter-radicalization, for that is a threat that is spreading uh, in the region, and Maldives, unfortunately, has uh, uh, been like, uh, uh, you know, virtually a heavyweight champion in terms of their per capita contribution uh, to movements such as uh, ISIS, uh, Daesh, etc., even though they have a small population, uh, they have a larger number of people per capita participating in some of these insidious, uh, you know, movements that uh, militate against humanity. Uh, quite recently, we have seen in the Lakshwadeep, for instance, uh, and around those waters, a couple of seizures of uh, narcotics and weapons. And uh, uh, it is such subjects that interest us. And we have already been uh, doing some cross-cutting uh, deliberation on such issues. So I'm glad to see that we have a meeting of minds uh, on uh, such subjects. But let me bring you back to our uh, topic, which is the emerging uh, global security order. Uh, now, uh, the first thing that strikes us is that uh, uh, we live in a very, very uncertain world. And uh, this uncertainty itself, uh, the state of flux, the state of constant change, which is uh, characteristic of uh, the global system, is in fact going through faster mutations, faster iterations uh, than before. In a sense, therefore, one can say uh, that uh, in the uh, opening, uh, you know, two decades of the 21st century, uh, the global order, the global security environment is undergoing a fundamental trans uh, transformation. Uh, on the one hand, we saw that a very fragile international compact at the start of the pandemic uh, had already divided the world. Long before the pandemic struck, we had seen that over the past uh, two decades in particular, uh, particularly after 
China's entry into the WTO in 2001, China has been growing at an unbridled pace. Its economy has been racing ahead, uh, and uh, that uh, alongside it has also been expanding its military muscle. It has been acquiring capacities that it uh, never had before, whether maritime or continental, whether the navy or the army or the air force. It has been moving into uh, high-end technologies, 5G, disruptive technologies, IoT. Uh, it has been uh, at at a, a broader level creating uh, large numbers of people who can actually uh, threaten the world with asymmetrical warfare, including in cyberspace. So that China, which has uh, been seen since the start of this uh, century, is one that was brought about primarily as a result of a number of historical developments. Firstly, beginning the 1970s, the United States of America engaged in a very uh, you know, uh, publicly visible and optical rapprochement with China uh, when President Nixon sent Kissinger on that uh, fateful secret visit to China in 1971, followed by his own visit in 1972, normalizing the relations with uh, a former enemy such as the People's Republic of China. This the United States and China did uh, in order to be able to match a Soviet Union that was pulling away in all kinds of uh, technological advantage in the 1970s. But beginning that period, we have seen that over the last uh, 50 odd years, China has immensely benefited from being integrated into the global system. China was able to displace the Republic of China, that is Taiwan, uh, in the UN Security Council uh, without firing a shot out there. Uh, and uh, in 1978, China began its four modernizations its open door policy under Tang Xiaoping, uh, and uh, this created the circumstances for its economic emergence. Uh, there were a certain, uh, you know, uh, a few hiccups uh, along the way in the early stages. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, there was uneven growth, uh, unequal uh, distribution of wealth, resulting in frustration uh, among the students and uh, the labor in China. And as you all know, it resulted in the Tiananmen incidents of 1989. Uh, but the hiatus between the global community that condemned the Tiananmen events of June uh, 4, 1989 and uh, China was short-lived because within a couple of years, uh, looking to the vast economic opportunities and under pressure from uh, the, the captains of industry in their own countries, the United States and Europe and many others moved in again uh, to normalize relations with China as if nothing had happened. Through the 90s too, China started getting advantages. Uh, it was uh, given a permanent uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, status by the United States for trading akin to most favored nation. Earlier, it was an annual certification. And by the time we get to the late 1990s, we see that the whole of Asia is reeling under the Asian financial crisis, uh, which uh, decimated uh, many countries of Southeast Asia, uh, such as Thailand, Indonesia, and others. You may all recall, as people who deal with finance and revenue and customs, that uh, it also uh, created the circumstances for the Chiang Mai initiative. China was able to use its economic wealth to engage many of these countries in major currency swap agreements, bilateral, uh, and uh, was able to create dependencies beginning the late 1990s. I think that is the start of ASEAN's, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, era of dependency on China, or one might say growing dependency on China. And then to add, uh, you know, uh, icing to the cake, in 2001, uh, the US administration went out of its way to bring China into the WTO and to give it that level playing field advantage for it to grow enormously as the world's largest trading nation. Uh, some other advantages uh, will explain the world as it exists today in terms of the rise of China and the relative. Uh, sort of uh, slowing down of the U.S. economy. Uh, and that is that after 2001, we found that the United States of America had completely changed direction uh, and focused its uh, uh, enormous capabilities on the global war on terror. The United States of America after 9-11 uh, vacated a large amount of space in what you might regard today as the Indo-Pacific space or more particularly uh, Southeast Asia. East Asia, 
the waters uh, around those regions, uh, the uh, naval presence, etc. Uh, the attention that the United States gave was to uh, its uh, war on terror in Afghanistan and later regime change in Iraq. And it was a debilitating uh, presence, as you can see. Uh, 20 years later, the United States, after losing so many hundreds of their men, uh, is leaving, vacating, uh, you know, Afghanistan. Uh, and one might say that the job really is only half done. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that there was this great void in the region, particularly in Asia. And it is the Chinese who stepped in. Now, what else aided them? Because when we look at the changing world, we have to see what happened about 10 or 15 years ago. The United States, the largest economy in the world, Europe, which gave the traditional engines of, uh, you know, economic growth, especially high end technology, manufacturing, etc. They went through the devastating two global financial and economic crises uh, between 2006 and 2008. Uh, the rest of this world that we are talking about, the conventionally, uh, you know, powerful uh, economic nations became weak. And China, again, emerges relatively unscathed from the two global financial and economic crises. Thereafter, beginning 2009, the Chinese realize that they have secured an advantage in terms of their continued economic growth relative to others. The rest of the world is looking for finance which can no longer be provided by the United States or the European countries. Uh, the rest of the world is looking up increasingly to China to see how China might be able to help them. And I think that is the uh, sort of uh, brink of the precipice on which uh, President Obama found himself in his second term, saying that we are increasingly regarding China as a strategic rival and that the United States would like to stage a comeback uh, or pivot to Asia. Uh, and that pivot, in fact, could not be effected by President Obama when he left office. But as fate would have it, in 2012, uh, President Xi Jinping comes to power. And I would therefore say that it is China that effectively executed that pivot to Asia. While the US was still talking about it, it is China that actually seized the opportunity, ran with it, and implemented the pivot to Asia. And uh, the rebalancing strategy, so to speak, in Asia was really not that of the United States. It was uh, something that was accomplished as a fait accompli by the People's Republic of China. Having done that, China also creates not just uh, vast reserves for itself through its own banks uh, to fund bilateral projects, but it also offers the Belt and Road Initiative, which was yet one big net again to lure and snare various developing countries into the uh, you know, easy developmental finance that China was able to offer to the rest of the world. And mind you, this has to be kept uh, in context that the rest of the world, uh, as I told you, was mired either in the war on terror or licking their wounds after the two global financial and economic crises. Now, that is the setting, ladies and gentlemen, in which we find that the world begins to change much faster than in previous decades or centuries. This is the world that had stayed generally stable since the end of the Second World War, when uh, you know Allied powers and China, which was lucky to be on the side of the Allies, primarily as a victim of uh, uh, you know the Axis powers uh, or Japan's uh, uh, you know uh, militarization and uh, uh, entry into the theater. But these five permanent members between them had structured a world order. They had structured. Uh, the West in particular, the Bretton Woods uh, institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. And uh, there was the linkage that these institutions made to what you call good governance, democracy, transparency, human rights in terms of lending as well. So lending itself had become a tool uh, in a sense uh, for the West to continue to interfere in the internal affairs of developing nations, many of whom were coming into their own for the first time. Uh, in the Afro-Asian theater, beginning the late 50s, early 60s, the emancipation of, for instance, countries uh, in Asia and Africa from the colonial yoke. But that is also a period of the Cold War. There was a Cold War increasingly between the uh, you know, Soviet uh, Union-led East Bloc and the United States-led Western Bloc. And uh, we have seen during this period that China 
actually ended up having poor relations with both. And then, as I said, with the rapprochement with the United States in the 1970s, both the United States and China came on one side. In many ways, one can therefore conclude on this particular portion that it is the United States of America that effected and created the conditions for the rise of China. And therefore, I also believe that it is very important to have good relations with the United States of America because it remains the world's largest economy today with uh, $22 trillion worth of its GDP, uh, still well ahead of China's $16.5 trillion. And it is the United States economy that can actually make or break uh, any other economy's uh, future prospects. Let me say once again uh, uh, why I emphasize this point. I emphasize this point because when you look at growth in Asia, when you look at the emergence of the Asian tigers, when you look at the emergence of even Japan from the ashes of the Second World War, you see Korea, you see Singapore, Taiwan, uh, you will find that it is actually access to and connect with that one great market in the United States of America that affected their rise. Uh, take Japan, for instance. From humble beginnings in the 1950s, when everything had been destroyed in Japan, Japan emerged as a powerful trading nation. It was primarily manufacturing for the West. But what was the West? The West was primarily this vast US market across the Pacific. That is to say, Asia, East Asia, connecting with across the Pacific, that one big market in the US. This was followed by others. We have seen that in the Republic of Korea's rise, Taiwan's rise, uh, Singapore, the Asian tigers uh, like Hong Kong, Singapore, etc. as well. And you can see that beginning the 1970s, China too benefited from the same access to this great market of the United States of America. And that is why a concept called the Asia Pacific emerged. Now, I want you to pause on this and think about it because what we regard conventionally as the Asia Pacific theater refers to this process, this ineluctable uh, an inevitable process of the rise of many parts of East Asia and certain parts of Southeast Asia as a result of that great connect across the Pacific. Therefore, my second proposition is that the term Asia Pacific has a certain historical context. It has a certain setting and that is the setting post cold, uh, post Second World War up to the end roughly of the last century. But today, we are speaking of the Indo-Pacific and the Chinese are objecting. The Chinese say this is not a, a correct term. You should be using the term Asia Pacific. They say this because the Asia Pacific recognizes the centrality of China. But the real representative contemporary term is really the Indo-Pacific. And I will now argue in favor of this term to suggest to you that it is the result of what has happened in the last 20 years. Beginning this century, we have seen that while China coursed on with its unbridled growth, it was not as if everybody else was at a standstill. Others were also growing in relative terms. So we saw that India too experienced very high growth rates for a number of years. And we saw that apart from China, there were countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, closer to home in South Asia, not just India, but Bangladesh, and further afar across the Western Indian Ocean, even the East Coast of Africa, where you had dynamism being seen for the first time. And therefore, one can say that the Indo-Pacific is a term that is more representative, more contemporary, more uh, inclusive, one that acknowledges a more democratic spread of growth and development across the region, no longer limited to East Asia or Southeast Asia. And it is in this context that we also see how the two great oceanic spaces, the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean, with the connecting tissue in between the Southeast China Sea and the Southeast Asian landmass, are increasingly one region in so far as several of our key fundamental vectors are concerned. Firstly, it is united by
I'm not sure, but somebody just removed me from the call. I was uh, kicked out of my lecture. So no, maybe no. the web, webmaster there might. So you're back on, sir. We can hear you, sir. No, that's because I had to log in again. I was told that you have been removed by the, uh, you know, webmaster. So I'm just pointing it out to you that I was removed by the platform manager. Um, and I have rejoined now by pressing the button. Let me continue there. Um, see, these buttons are very dangerous. I keep my hands off. Uh, sir, uh, uh, your video is still not available, sir. All right, I'm back on again. I, I was actually removed from the platform, so I'm urging the platform manager to please uh, watch out for that. Um, I'm back on again. Thank you. What I was saying is that these two great oceanic spaces, therefore, are interconnected in the contemporary era. We are interconnected from one end of the Indian Ocean all the way from the east coast of Africa to the Pacific Ocean through trade. You can see how energy, the sea lanes of communication also unite us. Much of global trade, whether it is energy or otherwise, passes through these slots, container tar cargo, you know, uh, say uh, large scale uh, uh, sort of shipments of any other kind, raw materials uh, coming through the Suez Canal, going through all the way whether through the Malacca, whether through the Sunda or the Lombok uh, Straits, they all go towards the uh, further end into East Asia and beyond. So trade connects us. Uh, energy also connects us because energy is produced in the Gulf and in West Asia. And again, <clears throat> some of the largest consumers are uh, in this part of the world, beginning with India, uh, you know, Republic of Korea, Japan, China. So therefore, we are connected also because of energy. We are connected because of terrorism. Terrorism and radicalization also connects these two oceanic spaces and all the continental landmass in between. What happens in the AFPAC area, what happens uh, on the Horn of Africa today, what happens in Yemen, what happens in terms of the presence of uh, Daesh or ISIS, uh, Al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula, uh, none of this leaves other parts untouched. We have seen how this kind of radical ideology and thought percolates into other parts of the region. In Southern Thailand, you've seen it manifesting itself in uh, a kind of radical, uh, you know, militant movement, um, you know, uh, so misguided Islamists, etc., uh, waging war there. You've seen it in Indonesia in full some measure uh, in the context of the Bali bombings and uh, the other, you know, uh, rumblings that take place from time to time. Malaysia has been increasingly radicalized such that I think sometimes even the government has been radicalized. They're playing ball with uh, Pakistan and Turkey now, uh, trying to rake up the Islamic, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, issue and attention uh, on Jammu and Kashmir, uh, partly because, uh, you know, nobody pays heed to Pakistan, partly because Malaysia uh, is a big player and partly because Turkey is so determined to stage a comeback in the Islamic world and compete for supremacy with the two other big boys, that is Saudi Arabia and Iran. So terrorism also unites us all the way to the Philippines, the islands of Philippines where the government is waging a war with uh, you know, extremists and terrorists. We are also connect connected today by technology. Uh, so it's trade that connects us. We have energy that connects us, terrorism that connects us, but technology also connects us. Technology in terms of uh, this whole discourse and competition surrounding 5G, for instance, uh, surrounding cybersecurity, surrounding critical technologies, uh, surrounding supply chains. All this is something that conjoins this broad space today known as the Indo-Pacific. And uh, this is increasingly recognized when you even look at the statements that come out from, for instance, the G7 meeting or from the Quad uh, you know, uh, uh, heads of state uh, stroke, uh, heads of government, uh, you know, summit that took place in March this year. The focus is on these issues. Climate change also unites this space. What happens in one part is distinctly impacting uh, other parts. Pollution, uh, you know, uh, the degradation of the environment. Uh, all this is today shared space. The air we breathe here is not too different from the air that is created uh, in other parts of uh, the region, forest fires, degradation of the environment. And so it is inescapable to, uh, to, to treat yourself uh, except as one given space. Uh, we have seen in this uh, broad context that there is an increasing, uh, let us say, division based on, uh, you know, uh, a, a developmental model 
and what you call uh, the tenets and value uh, systems. That is to say systems of governance and systems of economic development. That is where the core contestation today is seen between uh, a United States of America and uh, China particularly. So we have seen that uh, President Trump, uh, uh, you know, basically considered China as uh, even before the pandemic as a rival, as a strategic competitor. Uh, he was always advocating decoupling from China. But the unfortunate part of the Trump period in handling China was that President Trump also was decoupling from his own friends and allies. And it made it very difficult because he was decoupling from the people of the United States, from public opinion there, from Congress, from the Senate, from his own advisors, for he ran policy through 4 a.m. tweets, which were seen for the first time by his own Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense. And then they would scratch their heads and try and make out what was the policy for that particular day. Uh, Trump had actually cut off from multilateral organizations, including the United Nations, including the UN Security Council, which is why the UN Security Council was not able to call China out by name when the pandemic broke, because there was no uh, cohesive uh, structure in place. Uh, and you, you have to lay that at, the, at, at President Trump's door because there was no uh, you know, lead being taken by this one large powerful country. Uh, he had also uh, alienated uh, uh, his allies in Western Europe. Uh, he was uh, rubbishing NATO. Uh, in Asia, he was putting a lot of pressure on uh, countries like Japan uh, and uh, Korea to pay more for bases, a kind of a commercial pecuniary kind of uh, relationship, which can only be to the detriment of an alliance partnership, uh, particularly one that involves uh, uh, military cooperation. And uh, we therefore find that uh, as we go into the pandemic, uh, the discourse is getting sharpened on all these issues. Uh, decoupling, though sound, uh, sounded like a good idea, was very difficult for any country in the world to effect, including the United States of America. For over the last 20, 30 years, the global community had such utter dependence on China for manufacturing. The US was no exception, and Japan certainly was no exception because Japan had followed the United States of America taking the lead in the late 70s to patch up with China, to pour in investments. And Japan's own economy, the growth came out after the flattening of their growth in the mid-80s. Their own growth came out primarily out of the supply chains created by their own factories in East China. So Japan hardly had the same kind of leeway to uh, you know, uh, call China names, etc. Even though during Prime Minister Abe's period, particularly 2012 onwards for a full five years, their bilateral relations had taken uh, a downturn, a serious downturn and a tailspin. But the point I'm making is that decoupling is not so easy to accomplish as we discovered for ourselves as well. Because over time, even though India may have had the industrial capabilities to do more and to manufacture more, the fact of the matter was that over time, private sector chases profits. They would rather buy it from wherever it is a penny cheaper a penny or two cheaper, wherever they could scale up faster, wherever they could get their supplies faster. And that is where Indian industry failed itself, despite having capabilities and allowed Chinese manufacturing over time, willy-nilly, so to speak, to hollow out our manufacturing capabilities. But this they did not only to India, they had done that to the United States of America also, and to many a European country. So decoupling, though advocated by Trump, was a kind of half-hearted measure. And uh, when it came to critical supplies, especially when the pandemic broke out, the world realized that even in the case of the pandemic, even in the case of simple things like PPE and masks and gloves, you were all dependent on China in the first phase. So decoupling for Japan, let me give you an example. 89 companies in one particular phase shifted out uh, because Japan offered $2 billion uh, to their own companies relocating to Japan and $200 million for others that might be relocating to third countries. And out of 89 countries, the large majority, uh, you know, 57 or so, returned to Japan uh, out of that decoupling process. And uh, roughly uh, about uh, 30 odd countries went to Southeast Asia. Only about two or three countries came to India. And this is because it is not just a strategic partnership which draws your friends in. You have to have the right kind of policy framework and docking points 
you have to have opportunities for business, uh, hassle-free business, and opportunities to make profits uh, in, in order to ensure that uh, your, your uh, investors come into India with confidence. That includes your best friends because uh, one great principle that is true of international relations is that uh, when you have uh, close economic relations, it does not necessarily translate into very close political or strategic ties. Conversely, when you have close strategic and political ties, there is no guarantee that there is an automaticity that you will have very close economic ties with that country. That being true of most countries' relations with China, the world finds itself, therefore, in that context where decoupling becomes a challenge. That is why even in the context of the like-minded countries and grouping uh, such as the Quad, the focus is also on things like uh, what you call uh, critical uh, you know, uh, technologies, resilient supply chains, uh, and other things uh, broadly like uh, vaccines, pandemic, healthcare, climate change, and so on and so forth. Now, that is uh, largely the context in which we have seen ourselves. The Chinese, by the way, greatly suspect not just the notion of the Indo-Pacific. As I explained to you earlier, it removes the centrality of China. It kind of gives greater salience to the to the growing uh, you know, importance of others as well. In a broader Indo-Pacific theater, China loses its prima donna status and it suspects the Indo-Pacific as a ploy by the United States of America uh, to uh, contain China's rise, etc. Um, it suspects the Quad even more because it thinks the Quad is a military alliance in the making, a so-called Asian NATO, which has been engineered by the United States of America in order to contain China uh, and that it is bound to fail, etc. Uh, their uh, foreign minister and state councillor Wang Yi once said it is like the foam, uh, you know, uh, 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 in the in the oceans, which will soon dissipate, uh, you know. Uh, but now they are taking the quad a little more seriously because the quad has been moving up from within three years, a dialogue at the level of officials to a dialogue at the level of senior officials, then level of uh, in 2019, September, the level of foreign ministers. And lo and behold, by March 2021, it is a dialogue at the level of uh, no less than the heads of state and government. Uh, it is also a dialogue which, uh, you know, uh, has a habit of cooperation now. And that is something that the Chinese will be closely watching because in the context of the Quad, the primary focus, of course, is on shared values open and transparent, uh, uh, you know, systems, uh, uh, rule of law, um, uh, an international order that is open and transparent, freedom of navigation and overflight, yeah, unimpeded commerce. But they also look at HADR, uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, maritime security, capacity building, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. But at the heart of the matter in the Quad is also shared values. Democracy comes up from time to time. Democracy has come up in the uh, summit uh, statement as well in March. And um, it, it goes without saying that the four countries uh, would not be engaging each other in such manner, including uh, through the uh, multilateral Malabar exercises, if they did not have uh, broader security considerations in mind, such as the uncertainty accompanying uh, in the region, uh, the rise of China, the geostrategic forces that have been unleashed by a China that uh, is militarizing very rapidly, a China that is also asserting itself uh, in such, uh, uh, you know, a, an open manner, uh, browbeating countries, entering their territorial waters, preventing others from prospecting in the waters of, of Vietnam, uh, you know, doing illegal fishing in the Natuna Islands of Indonesia, entering Malaysian airspace, threatening Taiwan across the Taiwan Straits, so obviously there is much to be discussed. Some people do wonder, why has India joined the Quad? Why has it provoked China? Uh, is it that uh, as a result of such uh, association, uh, the other three will come to India's aid in the high Himalayas? I think that question is itself based on a very fundamentally wrong premise. India has never looked at the Quad as an opportunity to get the Americans and the Japanese and the Australians to come shoulder to shoulder. Uh, you know, uh, trench by trench, uh, infantry by infantry to, to fight the Chinese uh, alongside Indians. That was never the intention. It is also a very, very immature expectation because keep this in mind of all these four quad countries, 
India is the only one which has both, in a sense, broad maritime borders with others, including China, for everybody comes into the Indian Ocean today, and China has been coming in as well. But also, it's the only country that has continental territorial issues with China. The other three, primarily in the Indo-Pacific space, have a maritime uh, focus. And in this maritime focus, also their primary focus appears to be uh, in the South China Sea and the Pacific. India's maritime focus with its own given, uh, you know, uh, facilities and, and resources uh, 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 and, and naval power at this stage obviously has to be on the first concentric circle, which is the Western and Eastern Indian Ocean. And there I think we have done well. Uh, so it is not our expectation that the Quad leads to some kind of great military alliance. By the way, even without India, the other three have military alliances among themselves. That is to say, both Japan and Australia have military alliances and treaty partnerships with the US of A. Japan and Australia, between them, do, do not have a military alliance, but they have recently uh, 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 you know, signed accords uh, which are like AXA or logistic sharing agreement, etc. The kind that we have also done with not just the US, but also with Japan and Australia. Oh, in terms of signing all the other foundational agreements like BECA earlier, uh, Lemoa, uh, you know, Comcasa, and even earlier, Gisomia, as early as 2002, when that, uh, you know, agreement on uh, sharing classified information was signed in 2002. In 2019, during Rajnath Singhji's visit, uh, also the Industrial Security Annex was signed to that agreement, allowing the private sector now to cooperate with one another in the defense field. But the short point here is that the Quad, having a habit of cooperation, Having uh, also uh, in the background security concerns, even though they are currently working on all these, you know, uh, uh, good, good issues like uh, uh, critical supply chains and climate change and vaccines, etc. In my view, can flip over in the next five, ten years through that habit of cooperation, including the habit of maritime uh, exercises can flip over if a major threat were to present itself. And I say this based on history, because when you look at the First World War and the Second World War, uh, please read about it. The alliances were not formed right at the beginning of the war. They were all formed on the trot, on the fly. As things changed, countries entered the fray. As their interests were challenged, they entered the fray. Uh, so that is why the United States of America entered the Second World War only in 1942 and not in 1939 when Britain uh, you know, faced off and began. And similarly, in the First World War, you can see between 1914 and 1918, the alliance structure was an evolving structure. And therefore, I would say that we have to keep this in mind. At a broader level, it goes without saying that the Quad must cooperate with others because our own vision, India's vision of the Indo-Pacific is an inclusive vision. Prime Minister said that in uh, Shangri-La in 2018, uh, and in 2019 at the East Asia Summit in Bangkok, he spoke about the Indo-Pacific uh, Oceans Initiative, which has now developed into seven pillars of cooperation in the context of the East Asia Summit. Uh, so our view is inclusive uh, for the Indo-Pacific and uh, the Quad is a separate structure, not to be confused with the Indo-Pacific. But the Quad in its other avatar as a Quad Plus can also connect with uh, the broad constituency in the Indo-Pacific and beyond, as far away as Brazil, as it has already done, Israel, as it has already done, France, as it has already done, in order to, uh, you know, have a greater sort of uh, uh, foundation of uh, uh, developmental cooperation, if for want of a better term, I'll use that. So, uh, uh, Quad Plus is what you call a exoskeleton of uh, developmental partnerships and foundations with what I would call a, a security core. That's how I define the Quad. Security core among the four on vital issues, traditional and non-traditional. So security core includes the, the threats posed by uh, the pandemic or uh, critical supply chains, but also maritime threats, the rise of China, etc. But the Exoskeleton that I recommend for the uh, Quad is more broad based. We should allow docking points for others who don't necessarily want to exercise with you militarily in the oceans, but want to work together. And that is what the Quad is doing. 
let's just uh, end on uh, this note here then maybe we can have q and a but see on the all this that i mentioned to you was the geo strategic picture and then i tried to hone it down leave it down to uh, you know the asia pacific space and our maritime theater and environment in the context of the indo pacific and the quad but we must also look at the other flank because when we look at the other flank apart from the fact that in the pacific you have the chinese trying to be a disruptor by reaching out to small pacific island countries which traditionally relied on australia and new zealand uh, for developmental needs apart from the fact that china is muscling in into the south china sea creating artificial islands and also is a great force of disruption there apart from that they are also entering the indian ocean and i say that they are entering the indian ocean after a gap of 600 years the chinese have never been part of the indian ocean now their new found strength allows them to enter the indian ocean and really these are open uh, seas etc and nobody can really stop them but the fact of the matter is that their presence in the indian ocean coming after 600 years after the last voyages uh, episodic voyages of admiral chang he in the 15th century the chinese have not really been a major naval presence in the indian ocean they had a brown water navy they didn't have the capacity today their navy is growing by leaps and bounds they have something like uh, almost uh, 423 uh, surface and uh, subsurface combatants in all uh, the united states by comparison a much more sophisticated navy has roughly 350 subsurface and subsurface combatants the chinese navy is the fastest growing navy in the world uh, it is building a third aircraft carrier though only one is operational but let me again put it into context because there is the hue and cry about china naval power etc and one might uh, you know wake up and smell the coffee also because the entire chinese fleet even though it is the largest and the fastest growing weighs a total you know displacement is just 2 million tons whereas the us navy at 350 displaces 4 million tons it's a much bigger navy one aircraft carrier of the united states bristling with its uh, electronic arsenal etc is yeah. twice the size of uh, the chinese aircraft carrier so i think this needs to be kept in mind the united yeah, states navy is clearly the most sophisticated of uh, navies and um, uh, we cannot uh, underestimate the uh, fact that of the 11 aircraft carriers that the united states operates these are not just aircraft carriers they are they are carrier battle groups you know uh, with their accompanying uh, you know vessels and and armaments and bristling with technology uh, these of 11 at any given point of time they have three uh, you know at least in the indo pacific space uh, and uh, this is something we keep in mind but at the same time there is no gain saying the fact that the chinese are the one pretext or the other whether in the garb of fighting piracy Uh, in the gulf of aden or otherwise or uh, deep seabed mining in the uh, you know rodrigues ridge area in the central indian ocean they have been keep, keep coming into the indian ocean of late uh, trying to acquire otr rights at hamban kota bringing in a submarine in 2013 as if submarines are required to fight pirates in canoes and skiffs you know so obviously there is a larger strategic game being played out than the acquisition of you know uh, their uh, berthing and base in jibuti uh, you know gwadar etc they are uh, uh, pouring in billions of dollars of uh, investment or committed investment in iran uh, uh, this speaks for a strategic outlook that they have towards the western indian ocean which is vital for our security needs the chinese in this maritime space have also been coming in of late to exercise trilaterally for instance with iran and with the russian federation in the Uh, straits of hormuz uh, in the persian gulf and uh, they have also been exercising uh, with south africa and the russian federation in the deeper uh, you know western indian ocean of south africa to me it suggests that more work needs to be done not necessarily to prevent china uh, but certainly for india to work more closely with iran and south africa and most certainly with the russian federation so that they if they exercise they should be exercising with us we are the primary navy in the region as a friendly navy the russian federation needs reassurance that uh, you know what the chinese talk about the indo pacific is not all true it is not aimed at uh, uh, you know containing china or containing the russian federation the russian federation remains a very close friend of india it is a major pacific power 
uh, like the Soviet Union, the Russians have been for long a part of the Indian Ocean. And I think we need to do a little more work there to reassure Russia. Otherwise, they fall prey to the propaganda of China and oppose the Indo-Pacific needlessly. As you heard uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov say on a number of occasions that this is also like Asian NATO, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, the Arabs, by the way, are patching up among themselves. We have seen how Saudi Arabia and Qatar have recently at the start of the year through the Al-Ula agreement, uh, you know, uh, a certain rapprochement uh, between themselves. The war in Yemen is uh, easing uh, now. And I think Saudi Arabia sees greater sense in not waging that futile war, which has not really achieved its results. And lastly, I can say that uh, uh, disregarding the violence uh, recently between Israel and uh, the Palestinians in Gaza, uh, we can say that there has been a patch up through the Abraham Accords between many Arab countries like, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, Sudan, uh, Morocco, uh, Bahrain and uh, the UAE uh, who have patched up with Israel uh, and will have normal uh, relations. Uh, so there are these changes that are taking place. Uh, but uh, as I said at the start of my lecture, the world remains very uncertain. India will have to do all it can to firstly rejuvenate its economy because without rapid economic growth, we cannot have the means to project power, uh, not for the sake of it, but to protect our interests. Secondly, we have to ensure that our borders remain stable, peaceful and secure. For without peace and stability on the borders, there can be no internal uh, you know, growth and development uh, at its fullest potential. The face-off with China is something that we did not create. It is the Chinese that created it, but we have given a robust response there. And I would assume that the Chinese may also not have expected such a robust response for they're used to bamboozling their way uh, through Southeast Asia, bullying uh, you know, countries, etc., to tell people that they have arrived. But when they have arrived, they must also remember that there are other nations that have not been marking time, that others have also risen relatively, and that if China expects the whole world to recognize the rise of China, China must equally be ready to recognize the relative rise of others. That if China expects the world to open up its markets to Chinese goods, China must be ready to give the same opportunity and level playing field to others as well. It cannot continue to hide behind the facade of a state capitalist economy, which is state led using, you know, tariff and non-tariff barriers to block uh, imports even from India, including agricultural, pharmaceutical and IT products and services, and then expect a level playing field for Huawei and for everybody else. You know, it cannot expect and we are right in pointing this out that it cannot expect to have bloodshed and tension on the border and then say that as far as the rest of the relationship is concerned, we should pretend like nothing has happened. It's all hunky dory and let us be, you know, normal and, you know, please allow our apps to work here. Apps are dangerous today. Apps means you are going to mine my new gold. You're going to mine information data in this country. And I do not have that requisite trust with you. Mistrust is currently prevailing in this uh, relationship. So that is the point we have made to China that, look, you must not think that you can get away with the use of force. You will not be able to do as you please. Secondly, if there is bloodshed, if there is lack of normalcy and stability on the borders, you can forget the pretense of a normal relationship in the rest of the uh, you know, uh, spectrum of uh, ties that we have. Uh, we have to stabilize the border to be able to go on to the uh, realization of a developmental partnership with China, as we have said in the past, we would like to have good relations, but that does not mean at the cost of our dignity or our territory. I'll stop there. Thank you.